Hi, I'm Sander Hicks. I'm a candidate for U.S. Congress in the 12th Congressional District. I'm here with my old friend Bob McElvain. He is a member of the 9-11 victims' families. He lost his son here 16 years ago. Bobby McElvain worked at Merrill Lynch. And Bob McElvain has used his personal pain and suffering to become a peace activist and a truth activist. And Bob, you've done some great contributions to the movement for transparency and for a new investigation. And I just want to say thank you. Oh, hey, I have an obligation to do it. That's, uh, you know, I, I don't understand why more people aren't doing it. But the way I look at it is Bobby was murdered. And I went to all the 9-11 commission hearings and got nothing out of it. Yeah, that's, I, that's that's a big problem for me. Yeah, I also attended uh, several of those hearings, especially the ones that were in New York, and I just was like, wow, it's a lot of backslapping, and it's like a parade. The problem of 9/11, you know, you just couldn't believe that there was something wrong with the whole thing. That's why I became a war activist, anti-war activist, a war activist, <laughs> war activist. <laughs> well, I know what you mean, an anti-war activist, because no matter what happened, you know, you're, in the first couple of years, you're still in shock. And, you know, I just felt, well, there's still no reason to go to war the way that we were going to war. And what really turned me around, and I, you know, I've gone to Colombia, I went to Japan as a peace activist. And it, that is truly cathartic. You know, you just feel like you're doing something, hopefully, you know, walking with the Hibaka Shah in Japan at a conference on violence in Bogota, Colombia. Tell us what you were walking with in Japan. Well, peaceful t uh, September. I've joined September 11 family for peaceful tomorrows, and they're still in existence. And it's just they're just wonderful people. And we they made a decision to walk. We pushed a stone, 2,000 pound stone. Uh, all the unknown, all the civilians killed in war. You know, not to unknown soldier, but unknown civilians killed in war. And we pushed it from Nagasaki to Hiroshima. And we'd stop at places and, you know, you know, I just talked, well, we didn't take the whole trip because it truly, talking about cathartic, it truly was the most difficult thing I've ever done in my life. The temperature was above 100 and you're pushing and then you had a case on, the, the stone was on a case on and then you're just pushed and then you had a big pole with handles on it and you just push it for the whole day, every day. And it was brutal. You know, my wife had to go to the hospital. She came over. And uh, it, it was something, it was, that's cathartic. It's just like, I used to work in a psych hospital and you always wonder why people cut themselves. I, I, you know, it's, it's really tough, but you would talk to people, their emotional pain is so great, it gives them physical relief from that pain. And that's what the stone walk was. It just gave you the, you didn't even think about the pain you had. And then I would, you know, you talk to kids, every town we stopped in, we talked to people and it was just mind boggling. And when we got to Hiroshima, you know, to be there and what happened that day and to walk with the people that were there that day, the Bakasha, it was just mind-boggling. I mean, I, and I grew just to love the Japanese people. It was just, you know, but that was great. I felt good. But then going to the 9, and I went to the 9-11 commission hearings and it was just a stonewall. And, you know, that's when I just became active in 9-11 Truth because try to find peace is just... It didn't do it for me because my son was murdered and I'm getting nothing out of this. And I'm sure you were shocked to read in the 9-11 Commission report that they said that the financing of the attacks is important to us. It was important to us, but then it just got too complicated to figure out the financing of the attacks. And so ultimately we concluded it was of little practical significance. That was shocking to me. So now this year a lot has changed. We've seen some information come out in the 28 pages about the financing of the attacks. What was your personal reaction when you read the 28 pages? I really don't have a reaction to it. I, I'm happy because it's still being talked about. But again, Saudi Arabia was just another, you know, patsy we're using. I, I don't care who is financing it. it. It's the bigger picture. You know, we, you know, we should talk about the United States. We should talk about Great Britain. We should talk about the bankers. We should talk about money, the military industrial complex. It's the system that created 9-11. It's a system that did 9-11. So putting the attention on Saudi Arabia really doesn't mean anything to me. Okay, I'll go you one further. I 
I have hope for the pragmatic possibilities of exposing the Bush Bandar connection. So, because if we expose the Bandar Princess Haifa connection, then it seems to me that the U.S. deep state actors will be exposed. What are your thoughts? Right. Well, that's the most important thing. People must understand what is the deep state, what is the shadow elite, the secret elite, the shadow government, and that's where history comes in. What are those things? Well, the deep state. Who are the diplomats? No one knows who a diplomat. The you know the people in the State Department, uh, the people in the military, uh, the media. Obviously, the media has covered up, so they have to be a big part of it. So, the people on TV. Well, you can't blame them because well, just to give you an example, in 2011 when Bin Laden died, and I had Philadelphia Inquirer, Daily News, Philadelphia Daily News, and I had. BBC called me, Jersey paper, but in particular, Philadelphia Inquirer and the Daily News, Philadelphia Daily News. And they wanted my reaction to bin Laden being killed. And I said, look, I'll, I'll be simple about this. It's been covered around the world that bin Laden died in December of 2001. I can't give you a definitive answer on that, but, you know, I've certainly read all that. I really do think that that, that happened. But you have to look after that. Just don't take the word of the president or whatever, New York Times, that bin Laden died that day. Look into it. And, you know, I had about a half hour interview for each one of them. So the girl, and she was a regular on the Philadelphia interview, she calls me back and she says, the editor will not allow me to print what you said. Now, I wasn't being outlandish. Just said, you know, started naming some papers that talked about that. And she said the editors would not allow that. Okay, and she quit in a week. Wow, she quit. She quit. She was so upset. I got to get her number. I don't know. I don't even remember her name. <laughs> well, and now the Pentagon, or not the Pentagon, the Daily News calls me, and a girl that went to the same high school as Bobby. Wow. And she wanted the same type of interview. Then I gave her the same type of answer. Flat out, right there on the phone, she says the Pentagon would never allow that. She said the Pentagon. I said, you got to be kidding me. She said, yep. And she felt so bad about it. And I said, well, and again, that's not, you know, everyone knew about bin Laden, you know, dying in 2001. Not that I couldn't give him a guarantee on that, but it's worth looking into internationally. Right, because for what you're citing is the Pakistan mainstream newspapers reported that bin Laden died in December of 2001, right? Well, other newspapers came up with it. Oh, really? The French newspaper, yeah. Oh, okay. So it wasn't just Pakistanian. So, it, but, I mean, there, there's just two examples. And she basically said what they want, they want 9-11 family members saying, that God damn Bin Laden, I hope he burns in hell and all this and that. And that's what they got. You know, right. all quotes in the papers, you know, the hell with him, I hope he burns in hell. You know, and I was just giving it, I wasn't going to say that, but, you know, I said, and I said, don't take it from me, research it. That's all you have to do. But then they come back, so the editors wouldn't allow it, and the Pentagon wouldn't allow it. How bad is that? So certainly we look at the press as being part of the conspiracy, so quotes of conspiracy. Do you have any personal experiences with Congressman Carolyn Maloney? No. So she's my, the incumbent I'm running against. Do you realize that? No, I didn't. Yeah. She's a friend of Hillary Clinton's. She's uh, getting up there in years. She voted for the Iraq War and the Patriot Act. So my act uh, as a congressional candidate right now is an act of resistance to the cover-up. Because she, early on, she was part of the advocacy for a 9-11 commission. She resisted the Bush and Cheney refusal to create a commission, but then obviously kind of went along with the whole 9-11 a commission cover up and recently we reached out to her to try to get her to help advocate for the release of the 28 pages and the the sterile cold response I got from her just inspired me to to take action. Yeah, that's great. It's going to be a tough road for you. I know that. <laughs> but uh I uh, I've just given up on the government of this country. I have to come to my own conclusions and I said that I have to I'll never get closure. But I have to feel better about myself that I, you know, and I continue to advocate for truth and I you know I'll, I'll make interviews like this I'll do that for the rest of my life but I have to feel comfortable with myself anymore because I just can't I have to think of my wife I have to think of my grandchildren so I have to keep it it's always there but I got to let go of it too it's, that's difficult as a family member have you looked into the possibilities of, of JASTA any kind of legal recourse you didn't have before 
Not that I know of. That I don't, you know, I don't feel I have any legal recourse. I, I just don't, it's like everything in the 9-11 Truth Movement, I think, is a limited hangout. Everything? Not everything. I mean, everybody, you know, but the thing is, if you put it all together, that's why, you know, again, that deep state, people have to realize, you know, how many, from 1900 on until now, easily over 100 million people have died in wars. That's mind-boggling. Only 3,000 people died on 9-11. I know one of them, my son, but look at all the kids that are still dying in Iran, or not Iran, Iraq and uh, Syria. I mean, it's just crazy. You know, a book everyone should read is uh, Smedley, Smedley Butler's book, War is a Racket. Right. This is all about money. These people, you know, again, that deep state, they don't really care about us, the people of the world. You know, and, it's a very Anglo-Saxon. It was very Anglo-Saxon. You know, the United States took over where British fell off. They ran out of money. And that's why, you know, I love talking about World War One because that was the Brits. They started World War One. Of course, you say that to anyone. No, the Germans did. You know, who financed Hitler? Well, a lot of rich people around the world financed them. Including Lindbergh and Henry Ford and yeah. Prescott Bush. Morgans. You know, so it's, you know, Prescott Bush, certainly. <coughs> so they should be teaching this in high school. But that's not going to happen. So The Pentagon won't allow it. Yeah, the Pentagon won't allow it. So... I feel good about that. I feel comfortable about talking about that now. But that's what have, people have to realize. This is so much bigger than JASTA, Saudi Arabia. And I'm all for that. But I, I'm looking for my well-being, how I feel about myself. And to go through that again, I mean, I, you know, I went through the 9-11. I've been through a lot. You know, I've been all around the world talking about peace. And we've gotten nowhere. So I have to get some sort of closure in the fact that, you know, now I understand the world. You know, going back to Napoleon and Wellington, who supported them? The bankers, both sides, you know, and everybody makes money. Remember that line from Evita? Politics is the art of the possible. So I, maybe I'm naive, but I'm a little bit younger, and so I have this idea that a run for Congress could be a bully pulpit for advocacy for peace and truth issues, and we have a lot in common, right? So am I completely naive to think that the 28 pages and the JASTA bill and the, and the scrutiny of the Saudis, sure, in some ways it's a limited hangout, right, that to use Nixon's term uh, for, you know, partial cover-up, partial disclosure. Am I completely naive to think that it could lead to further exposure of the deep state? Oh, I, you're 100% right. You know, I applaud you for doing that. You know, I'm looking for, you know, I'm, I'm trying to answer Bobby, you know, who killed you? Yeah. Who killed my son? If you were the char in charge of a new independent investigation, who would you subpoena first? Who would I subpoena first? Uh, well, Henry Kissinger. Ah. Uh, there's a man of the deep state. You know, and he became, you know, he was supposed to be running the 9-11 Commission. That's the reason. <laughs> because he is the main man. But it's diplomats like that that have connections around the world to the banks, to the diplomats, to the presidents, to the premiers, whatever. It's the, that's the person. He is a, you know, and of course he's just a small cog in the deep state. Right. But I would say it, it's all about money. You know, another thing about World War II, you know, World War I. So many people in the 9-11 movement, Israel and the Zionists, that's become such a big part of it. But why did Israel come about? Why was Israel, you know, Balfour, you know, he was part of that deep state back in the early, you know, 1915, 1914, around that time, you know, before. Or when, right. Sorry. The Balfour Declaration, which helped create that, Israel. They created Israel to put a wedge in, in, the, far, in, the, in the Middle East. And so what's the Mossad connection to 9-11 in your research? Yeah. You know, what's the Mossad connection? I think they were thoroughly involved in it, but that doesn't bother me. It really doesn't. Because so many people suddenly will say, well, look, the Jews did it. So many people were saying on the Internet that Jews did it. Well, they, of course they're involved in it. Besides, you know, they're part. Of, but it's not the people. It's not the Jews of Israel. Right. It's the, it's the, system. the it's, system. It's the it's the hard right Likudniks of, that are in collusion with the CIA and the yeah. Bush White House. The CIA is a big, obviously, they, walk, they work for Wall Street. Like Kofor Black, George Tenet. Yeah, of course. Right. So... And that's part of the deep state. Wall Street, you know, it's the money. 
the Bank of London. They do not want the people of the world to control their own natural resources. And that's so damn obvious, but pathetic. Look what happened. Belgium, you know, Belgium, that's the reason we started World War I, because Germany went through Belgium, you know, but they could have straightened that out. But Belgium killed a million people in the, the Congo. Why didn't Brits go to war in the Boers in uh, South Africa, the Boer War? For natural resources. They can't take, no one can take over for their own natural resources. The people I met in Guatemala, Honduras, Argentina, I mean, we've done it. It's going to happen. Venezuela is a perfect example now. We're going to devastate that country because they want to go off the dollar. They want to take care. It's the biggest oil producer in the world. But they want it to benefit the, their own country. Now, can you imagine it? Allowing the people to benefit from their own natural resources? Well, that's what the deep state is. It's oil. It's everything. And people have to realize that. Okay, so, Bob, we agree about the deep state. But what can we do? Well, it's, it's a, it, it has to be a revolution, but obviously not a violent revolution. Amen. Uh, this whole country, the deep state, it's all about divide and conquer. We're going back to Caesar, divide and rule. So we need more so unity we, among, amongst religions and, and races. All issues. The and all issues. Hispanics, everyone has. It's, we're all being suckered. Ah, divided. And that's what it is. It's, it's, it's constant. Women's movement, this, you know, everything that you hear in the papers, it's all divided. Identi identity politics. Or identity politics. My answer is, you know, that has to be, it's like, you know, bring back Martin Luther King, that we need millions of people in the street. Uh -huh. And it has to be against the war machine. Right. Educating, you know, read. Yeah, read. 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 I mean, it's, it's so it, it's very simple. It doesn't have to be violent, but just turning off your TV is one thing. Okay. That would have a major impact with them, on them. And we need a strong leader, like a Martin Luther King. That I'll, can, I'll do it. Okay, well, I, I'll be behind you. Bob, it's so great that you were able to meet with me here today at Building 7, at Ground Zero. I think you've done everything a man could possibly do to honor the memory of his son. And I'm, I'm really, I've always been touched by you and inspired by you. And I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for the example that you've shown the world to not give in to despair, to not give in to grief, but to have hope and change and create nonviolent revolution in this country. That's, that's a beautiful vision. And so here today on the 16 year anniversary of 9-11, I just want to say thank you. Hey, Sander, thank you. Thank you, Bob. Hey, I love talking to you.